start, your heart starts pounding in your chest as your breathing rate increases. Glucose levels in your blood multiply as it moves from the extremities, resulting in a drop in temperature in your hands. You know this because as you cup your hand over your mouth, your hand is cold and clammy. Your skin becomes hypersensitive as muscles tense, compressing like tightening springs, ready to burst with energy if you move from freeze to flight or fight mode. Adrenaline surges through your body as the butterflies swarm in your stomach and your pupils dilate to give you focus. What surges through your body stems from fear and a desire to do all that you can to survive. How do you respond in the midst of fear? Let me pray. Jesus, as we take some time to delve into your word, as we read another account of your life while you were here on earth. Lord, would you remind us of your faithfulness? Would you remind us of the truths of who you are? And may it be a source of encouragement to each one of us today. Amen. Today, we're continuing in our series, Questioning Jesus. And the inspiration of this series was from a, uh, draws from a book by Martin Copenhaver um, and his book called Jesus is the Question. And so if you want to have a look at that sometime, you're more than welcome to have a chat to me about it. So once again, to those in the auditorium, to those on Zoom and those catching up on the recording, whether you be in Australia, in America, in Asia, in Europe, You are welcome. It's great to spend this time with you. I invite you, if you've got your Bibles with you, to turn in your Bibles to Mark's account in the life of Jesus. Mark's account, and we're going to be picking up the story in chapter 4, verse 35 of Mark's account of Jesus' life. Jesus has had a busy time in Capernaum. While people sat on the shoreline, Jesus sat in a fishing boat from whence he taught the masses. And in verse 35, we read, As evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, Let's cross to the other side of the lake. So they took Jesus in the boat and started out, leaving the crowds behind, although other boats followed. But soon a fierce storm came up, high waves breaking into the boat, and it began to fill with water. Jesus was asleep at the back of the boat with his head on the cushion. The disciples woke him up shouting, Teacher, don't you care that we're going to drown? Now, if we have a little bit of a look at this account, giving some geographical and historical context, it might be helpful to understand what's going on here. Jesus and the disciples are setting out from around the Capernaum area. And as we will discover, they'll end up down on the east side of the Sea of Galilee. Now, the disciples who ran a fishing business were were used to fishing on the Sea of Galilee at night, but they were also aware of the dangers of sailing on the Sea of Galilee and all that it posed. You see, in the Sea of Galilee and around Galilee, and especially on the east side, the hills rose to about 2,000 feet or 600 metres in elevation. They were a source of cool, dry, descending air. And on the Sea of Galilee, it was warm and moist, ascending air. The significant difference in the height between the surrounding land and the sea can cause large temperature change and pressure changes. Strong winds can funnel through the hills and descend in and onto the Sea of Galilee, causing sudden storms. But a fierce storm came up and high winds were breaking into the boat and it began to fill with water. Jesus was sleeping in the back of the boat with his head on a cushion. The disciples woke him shouting, Teacher, don't you care that we're going to drown? Rembrandt in 1633 is a 27-year-old painter. 
And he depicts this scene about um, in Mark's account of the life of Jesus, in which we see a fishing boat being smashed by massive waves as the disciples struggle with the sails to try and pull them down and the apparent um, apathy and Jesus' apparent apathy at their plight. Now, it's interesting to see the symmetry um, in the painting as it balances both light and dark. On the left-hand side, we have the light, even a hint up in the very top section of this painting, a hint of blue sky. But then later down, uh, lower down in the picture, we see the revealing of the fury of the waves as it crashes against the boat with the disciples holding on for grim life, trying to pull down the sails. On the right-hand side, we have the darker side. And there is no doubt of the dangers of the storm with the straining against the rudder as one of the disciples in the bottom of the painting is vomiting over the side of the boat. The only figure in the painting not worried is the freshly woken Jesus as the disciples interrogate their master about his lack of concern for their well-being. Teacher, don't you care if we're going to drown? Don't you care? In that moment, fear transformed each of the disciples and fueled their doubts. But at least they were turning to Jesus, considering... Considering that Jesus grew up 20 kilometres away with sawdust, not salt or not water, flowing through his blood. Yet there is a tension for the disciples. These seasoned fishermen go to a chippy for help when they're on the water. That's an interesting one. But they had seen enough of Jesus. They'd seen him casting out demons. They'd seen him heal Peter's mother-in-law and many other uh, miracles. Um, They'd seen him with a miraculous catch of fish. Jesus had healed the leper, cured the paralytic, healed a man by the pool of Bethesda, healed a man with a deformed hand, healed multitudes, healed the centurion's servant, raised the widow's son, and healed another demon-possessed man. But this was different. They were the ones in need. Their life was on the line and Jesus was absent. He was asleep. He was ignorant to their plight. When I was younger, my dad bought a heron boat. My dad loved fishing and sailing. My brother liked sailing. Me, not so much. Pull me behind a boat, uh, a motorised boat on a single ski over water that is as smooth as glass, going flat out. That's my jam. That's something that I love doing. Sailing, not so much. And I remember this one occasion when my dad took me out sailing on the Bribey Passage, which is just north of Brisbane um, in the Moreton Bay area. And I was cold, I was wet. It was choppy and the wind and the waves were stinging my hands as I'm trying to pull on this rope for the sail and do what I was called to do. And I didn't know how long I could, I could last. And my dad was calling out to me to do one thing and then something else and something else. And I feared for myself because I didn't trust that my dad knew what he was doing. Fear because dad was more focused on sailing than on my plight. But soon a fierce storm came up. High wind, high waves were breaking into the boat and it began to fill with water. Jesus was sleeping at the back of the boat with his head on a cushion. The disciples woke him up shouting, teacher, don't you care that we're going to drown. One moment, all is well. In a flash, all is hell. Let the weight of that sit with you for a moment. The disciples cry to Jesus, don't you care? 
Jesus' seeming inactivity makes the disciples question Jesus' legitimacy in caring for them. Fear leads to despair that Jesus does not care. You don't care. If you did, we would not be in this mess. Asleep at the wheel. They didn't know what Jesus could do, but at least he could do something. Not absent, not oblivious or worse, ambivalent to their plight. When Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind and said to the waves, be silent, be still. Suddenly the wind stopped and there was great calm. Then he asked them, why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? The disciples were absolutely terrified. Who is this man? They asked each other. Even the wind and the waves obey him. Jesus' response is twofold. First, he casts out the storm. And then he turns his attention to the disciples and asks, Why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? I think it's worthwhile putting a little bit more emotion behind Jesus' response. I think it's appropriate to do that in this case. Do you still not believe? Or perhaps more pointedly, with a tinge of pain associated with it, After all that we've been through together till now, after all that you've seen me do, don't you trust me? Where is your faith? Do you still have no faith in me? Guys, come on, this is me. What have I done to have you doubt my love for you? my desire for the very best for you. But even in the midst of doubting, as hurtful as it is to hear, Jesus steps in to reassure them. Two chapters later, in Mark 6, with the additional detail that we capture from Matthew 14, and we saw in the kids' video this morning, Jesus walks on water out to the disciples, The disciples, once again, are at night on the Sea of Galilee and they're crossing over and it's another stormy night. This time, when they recognise that it's Jesus, when they finally are convinced, kind of, that it's Jesus walking on the water, this time Peter calls out, if it's really you, tell me to come to you, walking on the water. But once again, the situation gets the better of Peter. And he fears the waves more than he faiths in Jesus. Why did you doubt me? Jesus asks as he pulls Peter up, out and back onto the water. Over the years, the disciples grew in their trust in Jesus. So much so that a later follower, the Apostle Paul, as we heard about in Acts 27, um, Paul is traveling to Rome and there is um, a terrible storm and as a result of that storm the ship is threatening to sink and Paul is confident in his trust in the resurrected Jesus that although he and his passengers would be shipwrecked and they would have to swim to shore that it would not end in death and for the 11 disciples, 10 of them that were remained, um, the uh, um, 11, sorry, out of the 11 disciples that remained, 10 of them that were to die, um, died martyrs' deaths. But even in them dying a martyr's death, dying because they believed in Jesus, they were prepared to trust the resurrected Jesus, that he did absolutely care for them, even at the point of their death. You know, today we can face all sorts of storms, can't we? We can face the loss of loved ones. We can face unemployment. 
We can face the breakdown of relationships, of children or family members who turn their backs on God. We can face a diagnosis that can shake us to the core. Today we can face all sorts of things that could have us go into turmoil and fear for ourselves or for others. And when things are not answered in the way or in the time that we want, we can cry out, Jesus, don't you care? Where is God when you need him to intervene? Is Jesus absent, asleep while fear swamps us? And Jesus will sometimes calm the storm and sometimes not. But the question Jesus poses is the same. Why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? Do you still not trust me? Do you still not believe that I love you with every part of my body? When we consider all that Jesus has done for us, when we take the time to read slowly, through the Gospels and what Jesus endured in the lead up to and on the cross. It is out of love for us that he does this. We question Jesus. Don't you care? Why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? I love you with my life. Don't you trust me yet? When I look at the transformation of the 11 disciples, two things are essential in their transformation of faith, of trust in Jesus. The first is that faith is built through proximity. Coming to know more about Jesus is is by sticking close to Jesus and by getting to know Jesus personally and intimately, not vicariously through others. That sort of faith is okay for a start, But when when the storms come, personal faith in Jesus is the only one that will cut it. The second um, aspect of faith that is transformative comes over time with Jesus. Not just in the duration of the amount of time that we spend in any given day, but over time as we discover Jesus is absolutely consistent in his love for us. Trust grows over time as we see Jesus is true to his word and his, in, in the depth of his love for us. So where do we stand in the boat when the storms strike deafeningly hard against the side of the boat? Rembrandt calls us back to his painting to look again. Light and dark. But how many people are in the boat. Any guesses? Let's do a quick count. Thirteen? Fourteen. Twelve disciples, Jesus, and somebody else. So who's this fourteenth person? We'll bring it up a bit closer. And there's A person in the boat looking out at you. Rembrandt places himself in the boat and he is in the middle. Not because he's the central figure, but because he has a choice that he faces, a response to what's going on. Will he go towards fear or will he turn towards Jesus? What will he choose? as his hand is on his forehead. Will he trust Jesus? But also Rembrandt is looking at you. What will you choose? You see, Jesus wants us to move from needing him to calm the storm, to be able to have faith in him and trust him in the midst of the storm, come what may. Not blind faith, but deep-seated faith. Rembrandt is asking, where is your faith? More importantly, 
Jesus is asking, where is your faith? Let me pray. Jesus, we know that when we get caught by surprise, when, when things crop up, when, when there is turmoil, when, when the storms of life strike hard, it can shake us to the core. But Lord, help us in the midst of these occasions not to turn away from you, but to turn to you. May we grow in our trust of you, that you love us deeply, that you died for us because of your love for us, to restore us back to God. Help us to trust you when things seem to go pear-shaped because you are trustworthy. Amen. So how might we respond today? Well, a couple of questions that I wanted to pose to you today. Have you questioned or pulled away from Jesus because you doubt he is trustworthy? I encourage you to sit with that for a moment and, and think about what the circumstance was and what happened that had you choose that response over placing your trust in Jesus. Second, Jesus asks you today, where is your faith? Will you trust me? And what encouragement does Jesus offer your faith in him today, in the midst of the storm? We're going to have some time to respond. Some music's going to be played. And as, you, as the music's played, I encourage you to respond to the things that God's saying to you today. God bless you.